Hi. Um, so, like uh, Evan Venice likes to tell everybody, we're talking about decentra uh, governing decentralized organizations. Um, so let's just start out by introducing ourselves. Um, so I, um, I guess, was formerly, up until about a week ago, I was working for ETH News as an editor there. Um, and that's kind of where I fell in love with um, the topic of governance um, in this space. And that led me to where I am now, which is at Blockchains LLC, um, as a researcher in governance um, to figure out how to, or to help figure out how to run that organization. Yeah, I'm uh, Kenny Rowe. Uh, I started my career out in uh, MakerDAO, did some consulting for a little while, and currently I'm a VP at uh, the Archain Cooperative. All right, my name is Marder Laul. Um, I'm currently on a five month uh, pause from working in this space, but as I said, I have worked as a researcher for Placeholder and will continue doing that full time starting in March, focusing on governance. And I did my graduate degree in technology governance, <laughs> which has obviously acquired a whole new dimension for me uh, in the past couple of years. So yeah, excited to talk about the topic. Hi, I'm, I'm Constance. Um, I'm a co-founder and director of Koala Foundation. We are a multi-stakeholder group. We bring together kind of the best and brightest of researchers from various disciplines and try to uh, work on hard problems for the ecosystem. Before that, I was a co-founder and general counsel, chief compliance officer of the Kraken Cryptocurrency Exchange. Uh, and before that, um, I worked at major law firms um, litigating uh, cases, uh, issues of first impression, uh, you know, whether YouTube could exist, you know, uh, what is novel and, and patentable, and also at the EFF, uh, where I worked at the intersection of civil rights and, um, and uh, our lives on the internet. Sweet. All right, so to start us out, um, so decentralized governance models seem to be gaining traction across industries, um, but what problems do you see as unique to smart contract based decentralized organizations that require new innovations? Let's go first. <laughs> uh, well, I think the, the, the context at which the question is framed, so you've got um, governance and decentralized organizations, which may or may not be governed by um, a blockchain. And, but for, for you know, this argument, we'll say that they're, they're governed by smart contracts, so they've got um, <coughs> let's say deterministic, if you put something in, you get something specific out. And in this case, it's gonna be, well, well, what, who has access to put in these inputs? What's the process by like human consensus that we're talking about in order to make some sort of decision about how we're all gonna act together? So I think one of the interesting questions that you, you first you have to, to, to kind of wrap your head around when it comes to smart contracts is, is sort of these access control issues. So is the, are these multi-sigs that are, that are some multiple agents in a, you know, a trusted or a hierarchy of an organization that are actually trying to represent a larger group? That's like one question you could ask, or is it even a single um, one, or is there a contract, like a governance contract that has um, popular vote or some of these other things? So I, I suppose the, the question meaning is, um, in, in the governance of smart contracts, what's your, um, what's your governance structure going to be and how are you going to lay that out? And, and that's usually, um, you know, you get two parts of that uh, design question and then like the human question. I think those two things often can result in some tension. Yeah, I think, um, I think the, the, the problem or challenges for decentralized smart contract based governance are actually not that different from um, the challenges of governance of traditional organizations. So, for example, if you look at, going to get a bit, try to get a bit theoretical here from a social scientific point of view, but if you look at how govern, um, governing organizations has worked for the past, I don't know, 100, 150 uh, years, starting with industrialization, it's been uh, what sociologists call the legal rational way of organizing uh, humans and arranging organizational structures. And the typical uh, type of organization that we associate with this form of doing things is a bureaucratic organization. And one way that I've recently been thinking about um, smart contract based or, or uh, decentralized s algorithmically 
done governance is that they're essentially automated bureaucracies, if you think about it. And I think the word bureaucracy has a little bit of a bad connotation, but I think um, that's, um, that's for a reason, obviously, because bureaucracies can devolve into a very um, inflexible and dehumanized context of, of arranging things. But on the other hand, there's a reason why like the modern world is built on these types of organizations because they are, to our best knowledge, the most efficient way to organize. You know, using the word efficient and bureaucracy in the same sentence may sound weird, but but uh, there's there's a case there, I think. And um, so when you think about how to set up these organizations or networks that are governed algorithmically. I think uh, the challenges are essentially the same, and I agree with what Kenny was saying, that you really need to um, define exactly the roles in the system and, and what happens when and who has the rights, et cetera, which is exactly the same what you would do in a traditional um, setting, where you set up either a corporation or a public institution or whatever, where you want to take the subjective aspects out, and you want to make sure that everything is done there's a word for it, it's called the protocol. Right? In, in bureaucratic organizations, you also have the protocol, uh, the way of doing things. And uh, it's, you know, if you think about the expression, code is law, I mean, then it becomes, to me at least, very obvious that, that it's really we're dealing with the exact same thing, kind of. Yeah, I, I would echo, actually, what you guys both said. Um, I think that a large part of blockchain governance or decentralized governance uh, narrows the topic to smart contracts or on-chain governance. And I think we, we, you know, to take a step back, when we're talking about governance, we're, we're talking about a lot more than decision making and dispute resolution. These are really reductive kind of forms of governance. There's all sorts of questions of, of how, how does a decision come to a vote? Who has the right to speak? Who, who are legitimate stakeholders? Um, how is common knowledge formed and among whom? Um, is, there a, is there a procedural fairness? Um, all, all these sorts of issues are, um, are fundamental to the issue of governance before you even get to how are votes calibrated and counted from whom. So, so I think that a large part of a large part of the focus has been around decision making and how to um, create that in code. And I think more attention should be paid to kind of all of the, the norms, assumptions, and culture that bring to bear before decisions are taken. And also, when we're talking about governance, it's really a two-part thing. It's the decision-making apparatus and also the sense-making apparatus. So a lot of focus, I think, uh, and I think that this is not uh, unique to, to blockchain governance, but I think very, very important because we're talking about um, reaching consensus among an unknown participants in this disintermediate, decentralized world, is, is how do we refine and create the appropriate sense-making apparatus so that the participation is, uh, is of a quality and, and with knowledge and with legitimacy. And I think that's super important for any, any blockchain governance protocol. Yeah, kind of picking up on that actually, um, what relationship do you see between um, cultural and social norms and governance models in, um, in these decentralized organizations or, or in what ways can uh, decentralized governance or, or a governance model influence social and cultural norms, and should they? Um, or, or how do you see those things interacting? Yeah, I think it's basically inevitable that they do, because any project uh, starts out not as this mass scale thing where you have you know, um, a lot of people involved. It starts out as something that is started by a smaller group of people, uh, often a single individual with an idea, an ideology, a vision for, for the project. And that vision is often carried by like fundamental values or, or norms of, of, of what the world should look like. So, you know, if you look at open source development projects, it, it's a very similar situation where uh, because these projects are at least initially based on volunteer contributions, um, your norms and values and your vision for the project has to attract people on the basis like of like non-financial basis or, or non-commercial basis. So 
So I think it's kind of inevitable that you have that. But as the project grows and the more people get involved, these underlying values that were there initially uh, may change, like either through either organically, like, uh, you know, via governance mechanism or whatever, uh, or they could change through conflict. So, so yeah. And something interesting to note about most of these organizations is even when they're, when they're small, they're usually almost always global by default, which uh, when you think about that, just as how we interact normally, like everyone here mostly has the some at least cultural references um, to let's, let's just call it like Western society. We know how to interact with each other, generally speaking, and not have too much confusion. But when you, when you start to begin to have global communities and the typical means of communication is text-based, you have all kinds of cultural um, just miscommunications at, at really fundamental levels. I've experienced this quite often with either you know, talking with folks from Asia or from other countries where we just, we just um, even though we're speaking English, we're not speaking the same language, but we've got to coordinate um, at a level to get something done. And sometimes it can be easier um, to coordinate on something as sort of abstract as a smart contract because if everyone can understand that a vote is happening at this time, they've got to figure out how to interact with the blockchain. Uh, but the, that's almost easier than discussing the issue of why we're voting in the first place. You know, a governance, I think, at its very core is, is a social process. So, you know, how we kind of negotiate the social space um, you know, uh, communicate, uh, uh, reach consensus. These things are, are really fundamental and, and come before actually the protocol itself. Um, so I think it's super important actually to look at what is the underlying social layer that we are now automating, that we are now making more transparent and efficient and make sure that we are we're making this the, the, the correct logical leap because, you know, if you create a super efficient, uh, you know, automated system on top of a really messed up social layer, you're going to get a very totalitarian and, and wrong <laughs> system, right? So, so, so these questions are, are super important. Um, and, you know, I think there needs to be a lot more done on, on kind of how, how we mediate our social interactions. How do we deal with in-group and out-group dynamics. Um, you know, uh, ironically, a lot of these projects are so focused on censorship resistance, which is a super important um, uh, feature. But, you know, the corollary to censorship resistance is how do we, are, how do we remain inclusive of people f to have the ability to speak in the first place? So, you know, dealing with the, the gatekeeping function on the social layer from the very beginning, I think, is, is extremely important. Um, uh, you know, we're going to import a lot of our old ideals, and I think it requires us to be very, very thoughtful about um, what kinds of values we're bringing into the space, um, not just the lip service, but, but really on a fundamental level, are we, are we um, listening to others? Are we taking up too much space? Are we approaching ideas with a sense of collaboration rather than a zero-sum competition? You know, these are things that I think need to be addressed on an individual level, on a meta level, and I think organizations like Aragon, um, you know, setting the values early on, setting the culture early on, while we're experimenting with various governments, governance models, I think sets a lot of the, the soft power and all the, the social layer from the very beginning that will then influence the kinds of rules that we come up with. You know, on a, on a basic level, you know, we have off-chain governance and on-chain governance mechanisms. And we're gonna have to do a lot of experimentation to figure out which features we wanna import from, from, from different mechanisms. So on-chain governance, you have efficiency and transparency of process. You know, but they're not so great with dealing with nuance or changing conditions. You know, on the other, other hand, you have off-chain governance, which allows for us to communicate, deal with human subjectivity, negotiate the social space. But, you know, these things are, are less transparent, more easily gameable. Mm -hmm. so, so how do we create hybrid systems that um, help us uh, leverage technology to do what it does best and then leverage humans to do what they do best? And how do we negotiate 
the, the power dynamics between, the, between each of these features. Yeah, I very much agree with that. Um, and coming back to my earlier example about uh, these on-chain governance, smart contract-based algorithmic, semi-automated uh, governance systems being sort of like bureaucracies. I mean, we're in Berlin. There was a very famous German sociologist called Max Weber, who was one of the, um, is one of the most famous theorizers of, of, uh, of bureaucratic organizations. And he said that even though bureaucracies are extremely efficient, uh, they can also turn, he used the expression, turn into the polar night of icy darkness and he in likened it to a, a, an iron cage where people get entrapped and it's super efficient, but, uh, but it's, it has no, it's dehumanized, so to speak. So I agree with, with your, what, y what you were just saying that we need to be careful that we don't turn these um, uh, automated governance systems into, uh, you know, silicon cages where, where we don't have this this option to fall back on like the flexibility of uh, the flexibility of human subjects you know the flexibility that they can bring into governance so yeah i agree with that very much mm -hmm. so uh, one of the main i guess promises that people see with decentralized organizations is that um, they hope that they'll help create a more fair and equal world um, but do you think that decentralized organizations are fundamentally any better or worse um, at dealing with inequalities in resource and power distribution? I don't know. I mean, it, it's <coughs> it, it <laughs> remains to be seen, really, of how well they distribute power and how well they distribute resources. Uh, one thing we do know about them is that they're at a, they operate at a different level than uh, either a local government or a trans or national government, right? So mm. if we're talking about well, is it possible that smart contracts and decentralized governance might empower people in you know, rural communities in Africa alongside uh, domestic you know, uh, urbanites in America? Yeah, that's, that's very possible that some um, combination of interest between those two parties can collaborate on an equal playing field to mutual benefit. I, yes, I hope that is true. <laughs> um, but it, there does seem to be some conflict or at least some um, some reason to believe that maybe that one, it, it might be very difficult to reach that or to cross that digital divide. Um, there's also an enormous learning curve for, for folks that will be coming up and they're not gonna have as many resources. So whatever they bring to bear is gonna be largely either a function of their intelligence or, or not necessarily their intelligence, but whatever they, the local knowledge that they have um, that interacting with that smart contracts and if they're at a disadvantage already because of either access to information or education or whatever, it seems to me that um, we still have some work to do in order to make sure that these groups c do interact to mutual benefit. Yeah, I think every, uh, every decentralized network inevitably has a, um, an unequal distribution of power and resources to st uh, in the beginning to start with. And that's like, base point of departure inevitably feeds into the way decisions are made in the, um, about how the, how the network should evolve or how, how it should be governed. Um, so one way to think about governance is, is exactly that, meaning um, governance is a way for those uh, who have an active interest in the status quo to defend themselves against those who want to change the system and also vice versa. So, so a good governance process um, allows for change, but at the same time um, doesn't make it too easy either to keep it stable in the, uh, uh, in the longer time frame. So, so I think research distribution and power dynamics, it's, I've written uh, a blog post about this as well, if anyone's interested. I think it's an essential thing that we should be thinking about when we think about how these systems are, are governed. You know, I think we all know uh, the, the great promise of blockchain is this permissionless, global, open coordination uh, network. And, you know, it offers, you know, all sorts of uh, new opportunities for, for communities to express their own values, to scale, to um, interact with each other on a more transparent basis. Um, but I think that the, you know, at the end of the day, I think it's really important to remember that technology is ultimately a tool and a tool is wielded by human beings. 
And, um, and only, worship, uh, only fools worship their tools. <laughs> <laughs> well said, well said. Um, so there's, um, there's a sense, sometimes I, I hear this a lot, that, that a technological process is value neutral, that you can create neutral platforms. Um, technology doesn't operate in a vacuum. So, you know, uh, you know, social media platforms, the internet, these things are not just neutral facilitators um, that just gather, um, you know, human, human activity in a vacuum. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a context in which this information is, con is, is collected, analyzed, measured, manipulated, and monetized. So the, the so for, for any kind, when we, in the absence of a, a thoughtful design to the contrary, a technology platform that is on its face neutral will facilitate default modes. So default power structures, default modes of access. So we have to really interrogate, you know, how the extent to which w we, we say that, that, that uh, you know, the, the systems that we create are really just, you know, uh, analysis and mirror of, of factfulness. Because a lot of what we do right now, as we interact on the internet, um, you know, all of this data and metadata that is feeding up um, these algorithms, our systems, our reputation systems, our protocols, these are not value neutral. So, so for ex I'm just going to give you a, a, a great example of this. You know, Twitter is now being um, uh, touted as a barometer, as the barometer of public opinion. Large data sets that are collected from Facebook activity are being analyzed by governments, by academia, by businesses as the, the, the truth of human behavior. And that, and that all of the, the underlying assumptions, all of that human activity has been produced through existing uh, productions of power, if that makes sense. So on one hand, we say, if, if we were to say Twitter is the barometer of public opinion, knowing that 15% of adults, uh, of people online are on Twitter, uh, only 8% of that number actually are active. And, and if we were to say, okay, from the datafication, from our kind of, our, our idea that now everything can be measured from all of this activity. If we, if we consider that the truth, then we're having a very, very myoptic, narrow view of what public, uh, human activity is, what public activity is. So, uh, so th as we're building these, these technological tools, these platforms, just realize that anything that's neutral is going to support the status quo and current power dynamics. You know, the market isn't really free. So it's super important to, to be thoughtful about how the assumptions that we're making about uh, how, hu how humans behave and what humans are capable of in order to make sure these technological tools are in the service of greater empowerment and not just ossifying or bureaucratizing or making more efficient existing inequalities. All right, a little overrated, underrated. Um, what do you think is um, a problem uh, with governing decentralized organizations that is overrated? An overrated problem? Yeah, something that you think is um, not as big of a problem as the rest of people seem to think. Uh, I, I, you know, it's an interesting question. It's, uh, I think, you know, we do talk a lot about mechanism when we when we're thinking about decentralized governance, well, how are we going to do things? And that seems to dominate a lot of the conversation, at least in the beginning, uh, I found like, well, how are we going to do this? H or, or even maybe how are we going to change it? Um, I do think, though, at some point, you should just sort of, it's, it's uh, you got to just do something. Like we, we, we talk about experimentation, and one of the ways you experiment is just, you know, try it out, yeah. it, it, right? So it's not, a, I don't, maybe it's not an overrated problem, but, um, you know, you shouldn't go through some sort of analysis like paralysis from just trying to figure out what to do. Just you know, put something together and, and see what's going to happen, but just keep it in a frame of mind that, you know, what do you want this to do? How are the ways might it fail? And what are the ways we can change it to make it better? Yeah. Um, I was about to say something very similar. I think, like, um, making things overly complex unnecessarily, I think, um, 
yeah, being a bit, maybe a bit too obsessed about um, about trying to uh, engage everyone in a particip I mean, it's obviously important to be able to engage people and have them participate in governance, but uh, people don't necessarily uh, know how to do that if there's not if there's no clarity about what the process uh, is or is supposed to. So obviously it takes time to build, uh, it's just like an organic process that takes time, but I think um, yeah, focusing more on being very clear about what, what the process is, or pr at least proposing a very clear process to begin with, um, instead of trying to, um, that's my personal opinion, trying to get the, like through signalings and things like trying to settle on a governance process, uh, I think it makes it overly overly complex a bit instead of you know sitting down and and putting a clear thing out there and then um, also introducing a process of how to change that process if that is not acceptable to the participants because I think people often don't know what they want <laughs> necessarily or don't they need to they need a starting point and then they can kind of iterate from that. I think trustlessness is overrated. <laughs> 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 I think uh, actually uh, Bruce Schneier um, you know, wonderful cryptographer and thinker his blog is amazing. Um, he he was speaking at one of our one of our events uh, recently and um, and he said, you know, you know, I, I, you know, I woke up and I trust, he, he, he said, I, I trust, you know, on my way to this conference, I trusted about a million thousand things today. I trusted that the cab was going to take me where, I, where it was going to go. I trusted that the roads, that the lights worked on the road. I trusted, you know, that these, these things operated. So trust is actually super important and we forget that because I think because we, we are, we, we, you know, we're a bit traumatized <laughs> from, from um, the world and, and we, and we, sometimes want to negotiate this this space you know with this specter of of, uh, of a trustless technology that will somehow correct all the errors of human judgment so i think that's a fallacy i think um that 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 doesn't exist i mean if you if you look at um the bitcoin protocol for example um you know there there are lots of uh uh, philosophical underpinnings that led to particular decisions and, and which is why you know people agree with that model or not um, so so I think that this idea of trustlessness I think is is, is uh, quite overrated um, I think um, and, and echoing what you guys said I think it's super important to, to experiment and build because we don't actually know what works yet so I you know Gnosis is doing a lot of incredible work on um, um, trying to figure out how to optimize various governance structures for what. So, you know, you have certain processes that might allow, you know, quick updates and changes. You have certain processes that allow for more participation and deliberation. We, we need to, you know, simulate, uh, experiment, and figure out um, how these work in practice and, and scale. So, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of work to be had on that front. All right, what about uh, underrated problems? What do you think that people are missing that we really should be paying attention more to? <laughs> the, um, that you need rules about the rules or how to change the rules. Okay. You need rules about that. So, you know, it's one thing to, um, you know, create a protocol and say that it's, you know, trustless uh, and operates on its own, but you can't take the human element completely out because if you want to change that, you still need to have that human process where you need to, you know, you need to have some sort of a, a, a trusted environment where people can do that um, without, you know, um, th that, there is a, that there is a process for doing that in a legitimate and, and acceptable way. So I think the need to have clear, uh, clear, a clear process in place to change the rules. I think that's maybe a bit. I don't know if it's underrated because you know it's becoming painfully obvious to everyone. I think that you mm -hmm. you need that. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the the idea of legitimacy is is somewhat underrated because we can get preoccupied with different 
uh, mechanisms. But it really doesn't matter which mechanism ultimately gets instantiated if nobody thinks it's a legitimate process or if there's enough people that don't think it's legitimate that they don't follow whatever the decision was made. So it, it is really important. And I think legitimacy is somewhat more social than it is you know, um, written down in a process. So mm -hmm. it's, and that's an issue of communication. That's an issue of buy-in. That's an issue of participation. All of those things go into legitimacy bef before a, a process is really uh, adhered to and is useful. If it doesn't have that, it's really not useful. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of times, you know, a lot of people have gotten into the space for various reasons, um, you know, to address inequality, to make more open systems, to um, challenge the establishment and status quo. Um, you know, and, and, I, and again, I think it's the I think it's really focusing on the social layer that's, that's been, you know, severely underrated. I think it's really important to remember that um, it's not a dichotomy of an individual versus a state or an individual versus a corporation. Um, you know, often, you know, we see these technologies or these spaces as, as kind of negotiating the two ends of the spectrum. I think what's really important is we're really, and this, this has been happening now, for, for millennia as we move from centralized feudal, you know, systems into more uh, fair, equitable, transparent procedural systems. Um, you know, this idea of creating, the, that there's a new social space that is between an individual and a person of power. And that social space is actually um, not just, uh, you know, the collective, so to speak. It's not just uh, something that needs to be negotiated and disciplined and controlled and extracted. It's actually a place where where it's it's a new space that where where we're kind of learning how to how to be together, negotiate our individual needs against the needs of the collective. And that space that we're creating and and um, institutionalizing um, is a place where where power is also produced. So we need to be thoughtful about what kinds of social structures are we supporting and producing as we're creating new mechanisms for that shared space. And I just, uh, there's this wonderful uh, uh, excerpt from, I'm sure many of you have read Yuval Har Harari's um, Homo Sapiens, where he talks about how you know, the lion walks in the jungle and is you know, really secure in his, in his state on top of the food chain. You have many, many, thousands of years, of, of millions of years of evolution, um, they kind of know where they are. And on, other, on the other hand, you have human beings who, who um, with the use of tools, have gotten up to the food chain relatively quickly. And we haven't really had generations of feeling very confident in our, in our status. And so we still bring a lot of our, our same kind of zero-sum survival, kind of bottom of the Maslow hierarchy of needs thinking to bear. So, you know, as we create this new social space, as we build these tools that help us um, uh, mediate and, and promote individual freedom in that space, just be really, really careful about what kinds of values, biases, um, assumptions that we're now, that we're bringing into it so we can actually create something new and, and better. And kind of playing off of that, um Decentralized organizations are entirely reliant on um, participation of the community. And right now, it seems like a lot of DAOs are struggling um, to, with voter participation or community participation. What could be done um, to increase participation by the community, and what's lost if we fail to do that? Well, I think um, when you talk about voter participation, I, I think you really do need to separate that between uh, people who are interested in governance and an application and token holders. They are very different groups of people. Token holders, for the most part, are interested in making money, and they don't particularly care too much about a lot of the other issues. So it, it can be a little disingenuous when you, when you say there's low voter turnout. Well, it could just be there is, you know, investors don't care to vote. That could be the same issue. So I, I don't know wha exactly what that looks like, but I think increasing participation is, an, is the thing that we do want to look at, but um, we do need to, to keep in mind that you know, some, some of these groups have very different motivations for what they're doing, and how to reach them is going to be potentially very different. 
Yeah. It's kind of a bit counterintuitive because the people who uh, presumably are in it for the for the money. I mean, they would you would assume that they would have an interest in how the project you know develops, and uh, and like par participating in governance gives you the opportunity to to have a say in that. So so yeah, it's a uh, it's a tough one. I think um, I think there's uh, it's very difficult to stay up to speed on everything that goes on in the world in general and even in a single <laughs> area and even in a single network. So if you're not engaged on a daily basis, then you know, it's it, it's the same old problem that you have with political participation in the in the traditional world. It's um it's not easy. So you need to find a way to kind of effectively communicate in the right way at the right times, make sure that people understand what's going on and um yeah. Incentivize. You want people to be internally motivated to participate. So if you, I, I'm, I tend to be a bit skeptical about trying to enforce some kind of an, an, an um, maybe an artificial incentive mechanism to force people to vote. So, so I think uh, trying to do as good of a job as possible in explaining and being clear about what the vision of the project is, and if people buy into that, they hopefully will be more active participants in governance as well. I think le legitimacy is actually really core to this question. Who, who are decisions legitimate um, if carried out in what way? Um, uh, was there enough participation for this to be legitimate? Um, the, you know, uh, there's a lot of uh, debate and discussion around, you know, what, who has enough stake or skin in the game to be able to participate? And I think you, we just need to do a lot of uh, it's an open question, you know, how do you balance inclusiveness um, with uh, consensus and leadership and legitimacy? And these will take a lot of different experiments. I know um, Dow Stack is doing um, some really great work on holographic and holonic, you know, uh, governance models. Um, you know, how do you let, how do you let dissenting opinion coalesce into consensus? How do you prevent consensus and leadership from turning into hegemony? And these are, these are kind of age-old questions that hopefully with, with all of these new models and the speed at which we can now experiment and test these things, maybe we can get something uh, closer to a, to, a, to a fair model. I, I will add just one, one thing. I think it, there's also nothing wrong in, uh, in getting more used to or accepting the idea that um, that not all people, uh, not all, uh, yeah, people want to necessarily all the time actively participate in governance, but they want to have the opportunity to do that if they see things going in the wrong, wrong way. So, yeah, I mean, we would ideally we would want to see maximum levels of political participation, but I'm not saying that it, it is unrealistic. I'm just saying that it's worth considering that it may be may not be the uh, the um, the normal thing for people to do. For sure. All right, looks like time is up, but thank you guys so much. Um, thank you. <laughs>